Hey guys, welcome to the Sissa Talk Podcast. Your host, James Azar here. I hope you are ready for a great, great episode today because I have a very, very special guest joining me. But before I introduce my special guest, who you see on the screen right next to me, if you're not watching us, make sure you go to YouTube and subscribe to our podcast at the Cyber Hub Podcast. That's how you find us there. And then just uh, subscribe to our uh, Sissa Talk playlist. You'll be able to get all of these. But you can also check out all of our other great podcasts, including our daily practitioner brief, our weekly tech corner, and special episodes. So make sure you subscribe now. Hit the bell button if you're there. You can also go to our website, Cyber Hub Podcast, and range of all of our content there too. And without further ado because I've gotten all the promotional stuff out of the way now. We can get right into this. Um, Joining me on today's episode is a very good friend of mine, an awesome human being, and just an all-around great guy. Scott Sykes, he is the former Chief Information Security Officer for BBVA. He's still with BBVA right now on a business role. Um, Scott, welcome to the program. James, so glad to be with you today. Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I've been uh, looking forward to... to for uh to to doing this podcast with you because it's um you've been with bbva now for some like 20 some odd years right right it'll be 20 years in in april so it's been a long long time and it's it's really interesting to kind of um you as a as as a former i i I hate to say the term former ciso right because you're never a former ciso once you're a ciso you're always a ciso it's kind of you know i don't want to say like the marines but you know, you never say he was a Marine. You say he's, he is a Marine. That and, is correct. And so tell us a little bit and, and share with our audience just slightly of how you got into cyber and kind of your career path as, as you kind of grew into your roles. Yeah, so I, I graduated uh, from college back in, mid, in the mid-90s with a degree in computer science. I actually started down the path in information technology. But what I found out was that there's so much interaction between uh, information technology and cybersecurity. You know, you have the monitoring, vulnerability patch management, which you have pieces from both sides, incident management, business continuity. And so I constantly was working with those teams very, very closely to help get those items implemented. There's a lot of effort between the teams in that. Uh, So I knew very early on in my career how important cybersecurity was. Uh, in that organization uh, with BBVA. And then I actually moved over to uh, cybersecurity from information technology. And I had a lot of support from the security team members that I've worked with for many years uh, to being able to move over into that role and being able to uh, to lead that team. So you served for a period of time as the chief information security officer for BBVA. Tell me a little bit about kind of uh, that role, what it encompassed, what were, you know, so, some of the, uh, you know, because BBVA, I think for those who don't know, is based out of Birmingham. So, you know, for a lot of people, when they think of Alabama, they either think of Talladega or, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of Alabama jokes. We won't get into that. So, so why Alabama? So I, I think it's really interesting. At one point, uh, when actually I had first moved to Birmingham, it had four of the large, 30 largest banks in the U.S. It was pretty amazing. And then within a few years with different acquisitions and so forth, that all changed around. And really, we only have regions that is definitively headquartered there. But the BBVA has a, a fairly large presence in the, in the southeast and across the, what I'll call the Sun Belt region. There's about 650 branches that are there that um, we're supporting. And from a, from a security perspective, being in a financial institution, it is really, really important. I mean, you have the bad guys are looking very much forward to trying to, to get in and being able to do fraud. It is one of the things we have to watch very, very closely. So my team was very much responsive, responsible for a lot of different pieces around application security, infrastructure security, responsible for monitoring with the sims and making sure we know when alerts were coming in and we had other things like third party management i mean there's so many vendors out there that we had to work with uh, to make sure that they had their security hat on properly and we're doing the right things you know we could have our all of our items covered and and where we need to have it and if they don't then there's a, a hook to being able to get in and, and attack us from that standpoint so quite a bit of effort that was needed from that side so talking a little bit about kind of your your development um, into the CISA role, what were some of the skills or qualities you were looking for when, you know, uh, 
so so hang on let me preface this question folks we're going to talk a little bit about leadership you know enough about scott at this point let's talk mm-hmm. a little bit about leadership because i think leadership is critical when you're in a in a, in a CISO role so we always talk about we always hear about workforce shortage the right talent in fact for all of october all of next month that's all i'm going to be talking about for Cybersecurity awareness month is let's build an api between CISOs, HR, and recruiters, because by the time a job posting goes out there, um, I think it was a while ago, I think six or seven months ago, the guy who founded Kubernetes was applying for a job and the uh, they asked for 12 years experience in Kubernetes when Kubernetes has only been around for eight. <laughs> right. And he applied for the job and they told him, you don't have enough experience. And he goes, hey, I invented Kubernetes and he sent them the Wikipedia page with his name next to Kubernetes. And so, <laughs> so we want to kind of build that API, but talk, sh- share with us a little bit about the skills and qualities you look for when you're hiring people, when you're building your team. What are some of the X factor skills you look for? And what are some of the paper skills you look for as well? I think one of the biggest ones, James, that I look for is that critical thinking, you know, being able to do problem solving because every day is going to be a new day. There's going to be new challenges and you need, we need people that are going to be able to look at a problem, be able to figure out how do I resolve it? Is there something I can do to completely close this problem down or is there a way to to mitigate the risk around it? Uh, Sometimes we have to think like the bad guys and saying, okay, what are the ways to attack it? And then being able to close those off. So critical thinking, I think, is a really big piece um, that I'm looking for. The The second one that I would think is that you need to be continually learning. Uh, you, you have a, a level of knowledge uh, from a technical perspective, but it always is changing. You must stay plugged into communities, to your peers, and also look, looking uh, what's going around in the financial institutions or whatever um, area that you're working, whatever vertical. So you need to stay listening and understanding what's going on because if you don't, you're gonna fall behind. So someone that is wanting to learn, it's something I typically will ask is what are they What are they learning? What are they focused on right now? And not necessarily a certification, but as much about you know what are, what are the areas they're interested in? What are they learning about? Tell me something new. And, and even if it's something on a personal level, that still shows uh, you know learning from that if it's a hobby or something that they've gotten into. The, the last one that I look for is how well do they connect with teammates and because one person isn't going to be able to do it in an organization. You have to have strong connections both inside of your team and outside of your team. So a lot of times when I'm asking about uh, projects with, with a new team member that I'm looking at, I, I, I ask as far as what, you know, what was the project about and who did you work with? And if they can't really tell me what roles or areas that they worked with, that, that makes me question how really successful they were. It, it's very, very important to build strong relationships with other teams like architecture, like the IT teams, risk, legal. You're, you're going to have to be able to do that as well as the lines of business that you serve. So that that's a really interesting piece right there when you talk about people talking about the role within a project and being very exact of what they did in that. Oftentimes, you know, a common interview question is, tell me about a project you were a part of and that you felt like you were successful. So, and, and they, they ask the question is always, tell me about what the project was and what you guys did, not about what your role was in this project and what did you have to do? And that's, That's that's a very interesting spin to that. What is that beyond just telling you about relationships? Um, do you evaluate sometimes the, what a person considers to be a successful project? Is, is that part of your critical thinking in, in that question? It, it is. And I, and I will typically ask, how would they, did they consider it successful? I and mean, was it a situation where it got completed on time, uh, completed on budget? Was it something that actually made a difference in the business? And, and typically, I lean more towards that last question because, I mean, you can come in on time and come in on budget, but not actually meet the requirement that you really were aiming for. Uh, so that's usually what I one of the items that I do push for is is really did you accomplish what you were looking for or, or exceed it or not and it's very very important to understand that with, with from the person as far as what did they do um, and working with who they worked with to be able to accomplish it and if if it's all about me 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 and not we as a team that can also be a, a red flag as well. Yeah, the I. Or the we is a really big thing for me yeah. when 
I'm speaking to p- potential candidates for my team. If I hear I too many times, I stop the conversation. That's right. You, you, you get too much into the Lone Ranger scenario. And there and I've worked with a lot of Lone Rangers, you know, who are very, very capable, but they weren't what they could be because they weren't willing to work, do the work with the team members to be able to truly get there. And well, it's much better to have that relationships to being able to accomplish more. Well, there's roles for Lone Rangers and then there's roles for team people. And I think a lot of times candidates miss the idea of, Am I a part of a team here or am I a Lone Ranger? If you're interviewing for something as a Lone Ranger, then yeah, I think we're, sure. we're predominantly trying to hear more about you. If I'm hiring you to be part of a team, I want to hear the we um, and right. your attributions within the we, your challenges within the we. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense. Yes, it's, it definitely looks for the role that you're looking for. Um, most of the organizations I have, it, it, there's going to be multiple interface points and being able to work together as a strong team member is very, very key. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, big, big aspect of this, which is a lot of times candidates, I did a, I did a video, video interview with a candidate for a position last week, and I counted the eyes. I had like a Roman numero thing, and every time <laughs> he said I, I just marked it on my piece of paper. And in a, in a 30 minute interview, he said I, I think 63 times. Wow. That's difficult. I mean, again, there are certain roles where that makes sense, but a lot of the things it's, it's, we need to work together. It's one of the things that I very much focus on is collaboration and being able to, to figure out how is the best way to get this project problem issue, whatever it is solved and working together is a better way to do it than just trying to do it on um, my muscle alone. Yeah. Title is also a very big deal. I think a lot of times people are always like, so what's the title? And I'm like, does it matter? Um, my favorite business cards are, you know, I have a business card and it does not have a title on it. In fact, my signatures never say CISA. You know what they say? Chief coffee maker, baristas last longer than we do. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, let's talk a little bit about us as CISOs. What are, what do you think are key leadership skills that CISOs need? So I, I think there are several pieces. The first stuff is, is you need to understand um, what the business goals are. Um, see, security needs to be part of the business, helping it to achieve those goals. Um, I think a lot of times security is viewed as a blocker to get things done in the business versus an enabler. We need to be enabler. We don't need to do stupid things and you know open the business up for too much risk, but we need to be able to enable the business to, to meet its goals. That is very, very key. Um, the, uh, the second one I would say is, again, relationship building. Um, you have a lot of key areas that you need to work with, and it's important to build time into your schedule, as busy as your schedule is, to be able to understand what their goals are, what are, what are their drivers, what are their pain points. So you know, before, in the pre-COVID days, you could grab lunch um, or go get some coffee, go, go visit your favorite barista, now you can't do that as much, but you still can make time to do that. Take Zoom Zoom calls, whether it's first thing in the morning, last thing in the evening, and, and make sure that you're still building that time, even in this time of COVID where we're limited as far as our face-to-face interactions. Understand what they're doing and what they're going through. Uh, it's one of the things I focused on um, throughout my career is, is making sure I knew where folks were because you never know when you're going to need that help in making your own initiatives work in addition to helping them. The That's third a, one I would say, yes, go ahead. No, no, please continue your third one. Yeah, the, the next one, the thir- third one I would say is negotiation uh, because that links into that. If you have a strong relationships built, you it helps you with your negotiation. Uh, again, kind of going back to that Lone Ranger aspect, if you're only interested in winning, uh, you will win a lot, but you won't win nearly to the level that you could by building strong relationships and learning the art of negotiation. Figure out the best way that you can um, get both sides what they want. Use the BAFTA, as I call it, the the best outcome that you can come for both sides to meet what they need. And so that's a very key one. Uh, The last one that I would say is very, very important and I think is underlooked is um, presentation skills. Uh, I have found in my role as CISO, I presented far more than I did in any of the previous roles I did before. I was presenting to regulators to the board, to our management committee. 
And it is very important to brush up on those skills. I, I used Toastmasters for several years to build up my ability to, to speak in front of large audiences as well as small audiences that were very, very critical. And so it's a good one that you can use that I highly recommend that you can use with different um, for different presentations. In fact, you can actually take it into your Toastmasters meeting and say, hey, I'm going to give you a 20 minute presentation that I'm going to give the board. Tell me how I'm doing, not from the content, but in the way that I'm delivering it. And it really, really helps. So I'm a, a huge proponent of Toastmasters in helping you with your presentation skills. Yeah, that's a really valid point. Presentation is everything. Yes. Right. I mean, you put it forth. I would have put it one. I mean, how you present when you're uh, talking to your team, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not if you're not able to present it properly, even if you have great things to say, if you can't present it well, it is going to get not the power that it should. So you need to be able to present it. Think about how you're presenting it. Think about your body language. Uh, all of those pieces go very much into being able to present what you're saying and making a difference. You know, you kind of answered my next question, which is, you know, the, the skills that CISOs need to have in order to become business enablers and business drivers. You talked a little bit about presentation, building relationships. Th those are definitely critical. How do we, how did you earn trust? I mean, now you've moved kind of from like the CISO role over to the business side. So how did that, how, how do you bridge those gaps? How are you kind of, you know, working with the security team from a business side and how are you coaching them to be able to be better business enablers now? So the, the big pieces around that is the communication skills. I mean, I, I very much, while I was there and even prior to even coming on as CISO, was building that relationship that it's a two-way communication. So I want to tell them what's going on and I want to keep a very consistent flow of that. I want to tell them and then tell them and then tell them again, not because I'm wanting to aggravate them, but because I'm wanting them just to understand where I'm coming from. It's when you think you've told them too many times, then you're probably not quite there, but you're getting close. Uh, the other part is the listening. So it's really, really important to listen to your folks and understand uh, the message and seeing how you're presenting it to making sure that it's clear because you can tell them something but if they don't get it if they're not getting the message clearly through then you've not fully communicated so being able to get that feedback and being able to make sure that your message is is tailored properly is is key uh, the the other thing that i would say is very very important around that is being open uh, and, and to listen. So it, again, kind of going back to that Lone Ranger aspect, I think it's very important to be humble and listen. And, and if something wasn't clear saying, okay, I'm going to make that clear and being very honest and open with people. Um, even if you have to give them bad news, like, well, that project got canceled or, you know, we couldn't hire that person that took another job. If you're being open and honest about it, people will respect that. And I think that's very, very important to do with your, with your teams. That's a. I don't want to say that's only an interesting point. I want to say that's a open and honesty. Integrity is so critical. It is. It is so so critical in our in our industry is because I mean we're talking about in, in, integrity of systems, making sure we're protected from a security perspective. But you don't have integrity in your relationships. That is even much more important uh, with your security teams. Is having that strength built into that. So when the times get tough you're able to to work through that. Yeah, that's um, that, that that's really a big piece, I think, that a lot of times um, uh, lacks is is the idea of integrity. And we see that in multiple different ways. I mean, it's, it's not only your integrity to the business, it's it's your integrity to the team. I think leadership's all about integrity, right? If I tell my team, we're going to do this, then we're going to do this, right? right? And, and integrity is also, if you're unable to deliver, to be honest with everyone about right. not being able to deliver. That's right. There's that, there's an aspect of we're going to fail, you know, and when we do to accept that failure and the way you accept failure also says a lot about a leader. Absolutely. I had I had a fantastic mentor. His name is Lee Bird. And Lee actually had kind of followed Lee along the, the path uh, with working in different areas. And Lee was always fantastic about um, – if there was a problem or an issue that he would back you. And now if, if you did things wrong or you needed to resolve for all, I mean, he would work with you on that. He would, he would not sugarcoat that part, but he always backed you as far as 
if there was a problem, if there was an issue. And I think that is another piece is that people feel like that they have that support underlying. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that issues aren't going to happen and you need to fix them. But if you have that support up at the highest levels, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it's not only support from within the organization, but it's only the support, the support and the integrity within your own community of, of, mm-hmm. of your peers, of being able to, you know, effectively communicate with one another and effectively assist one another is, 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 is really important. Let's talk a little bit about security, passion and community. Um, you know, c- cyber is, is for ages have been siloed. I now talk about it as not as a silo. I talk about the role of information security, like the role of a CFO or a COO. They're not right. siloed. They're across the entire enterprise. They have a hand in everything. Um, and one of, one of the very interesting points I kind of want to get into, and then I'm kind of going to go into the questions, but I'd love to get your opinion on this is, um, in a few previous podcasts, and, and, and I did one with uh, with uh, Laz. He was the former um, um, CISO for, um, I think it was co- one of the insurance companies. I forgot. Uh, um, I, I forgot. I'm so sorry. I'm having a brain fart. But right. um, Laz and I were talking about fraud under the CISO office instead of maybe under the CFO office. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the debate that we were having was around the idea of do does the CISO want to also handle fraud under kind of the risk capability, or do you want to just throw it over to the CIS, to the CFO, let the CFO deal with the bad news while you're assisting in the investigation aspect? Where do you stand on that specific topic? So it, it's interesting that you mentioned that we actually did have fraud was underneath the uh, the CISO uh, in a, a few roles ago, and we actually ended up splitting it out. But it did not. It stayed in the what I'll call the engineering or techno operation space. It did not actually go underneath the CFO because it was recognized how critical that is. And so at, when I was a CISO, I was working very closely with the director of fraud operations and fraud and making sure that that investigation piece was working properly, but also making sure that they had, you know, help with accessing the data that they needed to, to being able to run the reporting and the alerting that was a, such a huge part of fraud. So I, I'm very much about that. I think it, it has to stay very close to the security aspects. Uh, as I mentioned before, in some cases it can go under, underneath the CISO, but if it's not, it needs to stay very close. And I think the way that we, we did it at BBVA was a really, good ideas having it although it's peer it's very close and very tightly integrated so there was a lot of those uh, conversations back and forth not just at my level but even between the different teams on both the fraud side and the security side yeah so um for everyone's sake um laz uh, was the CISO at mass mutual voya and city there you and go so um laz an amazing amazing guy um really um we, we had this discussion around just the idea of fraud and cyber and especially in the financial realm fraud and cyber are of one and it still fascinates me that in a lot of organizations fraud is still under the cfo office and cyber only assists in kind of like the investigation piece like hey give us uh all the ip addresses for this account because we have ach fraud but it's not sitting under the office of the CISO. So fascinates me that until today some some organizations are are, are thinking that way yeah, I think the integration is too, too key to, to have it that far separated. So in our case, um, both of them are reporting up to the CIO, both the director of fraud and the CISO. And I think from that perspective, it also helps with reporting to the CIO to get that additional push in the other areas because of the importance of fraud and security from that standpoint. Yeah, it's um, that's that's really fascinating. So kind of going into your day-to-day as a CISO, what aspect of security did you spend the most time on? Um, and why and why that specific aspect of security? So what I, what I will say is there was a lot of work on the, again, third-party management. I think that was one of the biggest pieces um, that we did a lot of work on uh, because there was a lot of um, the vendor review that was going on and making sure all of the different pieces were in, in place some of which obviously goes over into the risk side. So we had to have a very good relationship with our risk partners, which is one of the thing, one of the pieces that I worked very hard to build a strong relationship with. 
but it's ensuring that they're meeting all of the requirements and then when things change because they do change. So one of the things we did was we, we purchased a tool called Security Scorecard. They actually helps us with the ongoing monitoring for our vendors, um, whether they are a, like a service provider, um, like they provide people, or they could be providing software or other types of services and looking at how they are measuring up against the benchmark. And if they start dropping down, we actually have alerts and it actually has it broken down into many different categories. So that was one of the key things that we, uh, that we implemented. The other one that I'll mention and is one of the pain points I think most of us have is vulnerability management. That was one of the other really key parts is um, resolving some issues that we had around the reporting aspects and really getting it into such a way of, of not looking at just raw numbers of vulnerabilities, but looking at the risk levels like this, having these vulnerabilities, uh, even if it's a smaller number are much more risky because of uh, the type, the type of system or the type of data and really being able to get that across and doing it in a risk based approach versus just a sheer number of vulnerabilities uh, in an environment or on an application. So forth. Yeah. I I'll agree with you on vulnerability management. Um, to me, third party is is, is something I, I absolutely agree with. I am, um, I'll say that I'm really strict with third parties. Vulnerability management. That's why I do the practitioner brief daily. Right. <laughs> um, for the life of me, people. For anyone listening, zero log on, patch it now, please. Microsoft, CISA, FBI, NSA, the U.S. government, everyone screaming patch and. As of this morning, I, I did the practitioner brief this morning, and I was checking on Shodan how many compu- thousands of them are still unpatched. Yes, thousands. It, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's such it's such a hard part too for the. And again, I came over kneeling with the patch management side because you're getting hit bombarded with numbers, and it's like, okay, what do I? And it's like, how do I patch all of this and keeping up and actually doing some level of prioritization. So that's one of the pieces that we worked through with the vulnerability management team was being able to say, you know, here's the areas to focus on, but being able to do it at a risk based level versus a pure number level. And even right. even like if Microsoft, for instance, releases critical patch, is that critical in your environment or not? Or could it be they give a medium, but it's actually critical to you because of the type of system it's on, the type of data that's there, the type of APIs and transactions that occur. That one may need to go well before another critical that comes from Microsoft. As in, just as an example. Yeah, that's uh, that. That's a great point. What's a nine point eight for Microsoft could be a two point two for you. Exactly. Um, that's exactly right. Because of the way you implement it, uh, because of the way you're using it, and exactly. that's why it's critical for you to know. And then this goes back to what you were talking about earlier: relationships, being mm-hmm. able to uh, pick up the phone and call the CTO and be like, "Hey, how are we using this specific tool?" I see it that it's on our inventory list. It's on our software list. There's a patch for it, but we want to know, you know, are we utilizing it to its full capability? Is it a backup? Is it just something that we're running one small program through that's seldom used? I mean, what is it? And and, and then figuring that out. Yeah, Um, One of the things we did from a program perspective at a risk-based level is look at a tolerance. So we, we have obviously there's there is a certain line that it's like, OK, that's above tolerance. You really need to you know even stop your regular programming work and then actually work to move that back. But there's a tolerance level and there's understanding that there's ebbs and flows at, in that tolerance level. And the good part of it is, is if you can do it at an application layer, as far as saying that this application is that it can encompass many different parts of it. It can encompass, obviously, the IT portions, but it also can encompass the code. It can encompass the third party connections. And so doing it that way with a risk-based approach, I think is a much wiser idea than looking in a siloed approach to saying this server needs to be patched or this database needs to be patched or this application needs to be patched as you're looking at the whole, the whole piece around that application and saying, here it is, here's where it is in the threshold. And then being able to drill into that with the teams that actually can help make the biggest difference that helps from a prioritization standpoint as well. So you talked a little bit about some of the projects you worked on from, you know, security scorecard, third party implementation to vulnerability management. What was the project that you felt was the most rewarding one for you? I I think that one on the vulnerability management was because we really were able to open people's eyes because again, people's eyes would start rolling back in their head when you start telling them they have a thousand vulnerabilities 
uh, and they've got to drop everything to fix it versus saying, look at this from a criticality perspective. Look at this formula and, and explaining what the formula is and then showing it to them and then showing them if they apply these things, it changes their score from maybe a high to a medium, just doing these five things. So it really helps them to say, oh, from a focused perspective, this is where I need to do. The other part that it really helped us to do is we, we actually implemented a new tool to help with it that was was really strong in being able to go out and scan on its own to being able to determine systems and making sure that things were covered. Because a lot of the tools that you will have will be requiring to have a certain inventory built into themselves, like the SCCMs of the world or the Cisco works and so forth. Having a tool that can go out there and detect things and making sure that all of your bases are covered is also really powerful. So that if something needs to be closed down because it's not been used and it hasn't been, going back and saying, hey, we found this and, and being able to close that down, closes the attack vector and is able to protect it. So I, I think to me, this one was really the big because it opened a lot of people's eyes and being able to, to show the data in a way from a risk-based approach versus just the sheer quantities approach and being able to go out and do the necessary auto scanning to figuring out what was out there and helping to close gaps where they needed to be closed. I, I feel like vulnerability management is one of those um, projects within an organization that's constantly ongoing. Absolutely. We're seeing a lot of vulnerability management take a backseat right now to the cloud transformation. An insane amount of vulnerability management projects have taken a backseat to cloud. And uh, uh, this week on, on one of my practitioner briefs, um, for those who have not subscribed, if you uh, if you're on your podcast listening platform where you're listening to CISO Talk, if you look up CyberHub Podcast, you can subscribe and get our practitioner brief Monday through Thursday. Um, you know, three to four stories. Uh, I've been doing it for nearly six months now. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, because, you know, every morning, every I think every CISO I know, you know, we spend about half an hour to 45 minutes just really seeing what's happening out in the wild. So I've taken that and I've kind of put it into a five minute to six minute podcast every single day. The more information you can get, the better in that part and being able to get that from other CISOs is so, so incredible and in hearing what's going on and understanding that. I think it's such a it's such a key part of what we do. No, I, and, and I agree. What I found, though, is as I was looking through a lot of the news, I, I'd find a lot of fluff. And the fluff is, this guy's been sentenced to jail. These guys are wanted. And I'm like, nice, but does nothing to my day-to-day. -day. The fact that right. one guy who did a breach uh, 10 years ago got five years in jail does nothing to me. It, it, I'm not more secure today than I was yesterday. Because when you take one of these guys down, 10 others pop up. So, you know, let's just mathematically speaking, I'm not any more secure. It's finding the real, um, a lot of times the important headlines get buried. Yeah. The important stories get buried. So zero log on, big deal, critical vulnerability. It's everywhere, right? right. But one of the vulnerabilities I was looking at today um, was the cloud. So Google Cloud had a workaround where an open database could be accessed by anyone who just really? knew how to search the Google Cloud platform. Mm. Wow. So a lot of people use Google Cloud, not as much as AWS, obviously, but people use Google. And that was buried. Like I had to go searching for it to find it. And it wasn't a sexy headline right? It, it doesn't get you to click, but it's critical. If you're working on a Google cloud platform, this vulnerability that needs to be patched, it's critical for your business. Yeah. I, I think part of the problem we have, and, and obviously we need to have these is the, you know, what happens after the fact, you know, like if you have ransomware attacks and understanding who's impacted, especially as a business, because you may rely on them. But those predecessor items that could help you protect against it need to be screened from the from the rooftop, so to speak. And a lot of times they do get buried down. And you would think something is certainly as big as Google Cloud Platform, which so many companies use, it, it needs to be way out in front. And it was not. But it's not because it's not clickbait. You know what's clickbait? You know what right. people click on? Um, 
and 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 I think that's one of the challenges is um, the the a lot of the uh, people who are um, trying to sell us the best solution when you go through their LinkedIn feed this guy's been arrested for this this uh, breach happened this ransomware attack on um, so and so is going on and I go that's great you know you're not going to have anything other than to tell me they're under a ransomware attack there's nothing in that article that's going to help me be more secure a ransomware attack is a ransomware attack they got in somehow predominantly through email so you want to have a conversation about that solution we can have the conversation about that solution but that's about where where, where it all stops and the real stories that we look for aren't there they just don't exist so very true so very true um, um they, they, they don't you- exist you don't find them they get buried and so my practitioner brief i like literally spend a lot of time because i look for the buried stories i read the threat intel reports i see what's coming out of the different isacs what's coming out of CISA, fbi and are they are, are they sending out an alert for fluff are they sending out an alert that's critical uh, th- those things matter i do for sure and and vulnerability management to me is is your basic blocking and tackling in any security program absolutely and if you can't get that part right you're going to have problems later on so that was one well, of the biggest pieces that i did for sure to start with <laughs> to make sure yeah that was i mean right. if you don't have a good vulnerability management program it doesn't matter what tools you buy it doesn't matter what budget you have that's right absolutely right yeah, a lot of our, a lot of the piece around the tool, while the tool was important to getting the data, a lot of it was building the process and procedure around this risk-based model. And to me, that was really, really key. And being able to make sure people could understand it when you went, when, when they went through it, again, versus just giving them a spreadsheet with a huge amount of numbers. To me, it's so much better in being able to do that. But you have to be able to build that process and procedure and have the strong enough relationships with you know the software engineers the infrastructure engineers to being able to explain it and saying this is going to make this is going to make us more secure and it makes your life easier because you know what to prioritize for sure yeah it's um you, you you've nailed it on the head right there i mean if 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 you can't prioritize if you can't look at your risk you're you're oftentimes you're going to find yourself on the short end of the stick when when something bad happens absolutely so let's let's talk a little bit about our challenges as security practitioners so what are some of the challenges that you you think were overcoming old news stuff that you know it's done with we shouldn't be having these problems anymore i i think one just because of what i mentioned about the you know all of these uh, ransomware attacks and hacking security is being recognized as a very important part of the business so we're, we're getting a chair more than we used to uh, used to be it was kind of in the corner, let them go do their dark ops stuff. Now it's like we must consider security as part of our uh, as part of our business. So that means that you're out in front and being able to talk to you, to your peers and even to people higher up in the organization to help make those decisions. Uh, I would say on the flip side of that, we have to do a better job at being able to help them with their business processes versus saying we need to buy this tool or we need six more people. We need to be able to say, this is what we need to do. Maybe it's tweaking a process or putting a certain monitoring plan in place so that they can go forward with this new new application or this new product that they're doing for the business. Um, Not all business people understand security, but they certainly understand return on investment. And if you go say, we need this $5 million tool and it doesn't provide the benefit, anywhere near the benefit for it, It'll be remembered the next time you come and say, well, to do this, I need another $5 million tool. So really, we need to understand what the business is trying to resolve and being able to come up with solutions. It might need a tool. It might need people, but not just start with that. Look at the look at are there things we can do from a procedural perspective, from a process perspective, it, it, it being able to help the business from that part and being able to, to stay on track is really, really key. So I think that's one thing that we need to be very careful of as security experts. So let me push back on you there. So okay. I, I, I'm going to push back slightly. Um, All right. I promise to be nice. A lot of times when a business comes and says, James, here's what we want to do. It's better to say I need $5 million and get two and a half. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and then go build the business process. And and I think the challenge for that, and I think one of the reasons um, that's been common within Sysos is because we're so uh, often we're underfunded, and so you're able to. Um, take a passion project that they want to do or a big project they want to execute on over inflate that budget slightly in order to implement other things that you need to get done but you're not getting the budget to get get them done at this simultaneously so i mean we, we have to look at the flip side of that is you know CISOs when they go and say i want to buy this five million dollar tool it's probably because they've been meaning to buy the smaller version of that tool for ages and they can't get the budget. Well, now they go, hey, let me get the $5 million and I can buy a whole set of tools to help solve this issue, but also strengthen and, and, and uphold our program uh, across different aspects as well. And, and I would say that is that is a very key part as far as the business case for it. Uh, if, if you're, if, like you said, you're doing it for, and it solves a piece of the puzzle, that's one thing. But if you're able to say it's able to resolve these other items and you can make the stronger case, I am 100 percent there with you on it. I think I think we just need to make sure that we're selling it in the right way from a business case perspective. Uh, I certainly understand the underfunding aspect of it. it. We one of the things you always have to deal with as a leader is there's some level of constraints. And so whether that's people or tools or funding in general. And so you need to always look for opportunities to being able to do it. Again, I think that's where relationship building comes in so that they understand that they can trust you and what you're trying to do is to help the business to grow and to move forward. And I think if you do that and you have that strong relationship built, you can make the case and you can move forward with it. And and I, I, I and I'll agree with everything you said, and I'm going to put an asterisk next to that. And, and, and the asterisk next to that is in an ideal situation, in an ideal organization, in an ideal everything, you know, you'd be able to execute on your plans and and defend the organization and do so successfully as much as humanly possible with an organization that understands that we're going to experience an X amount of uh, cyber incidents that are of low impact, of medium impact, um, a handful that are high impact and so forth, because that's just the standard of the business. I think one of the things I learned early on to do when I'm presenting to the board is I always put expected um, cyber incidents in a year. And I take the industry average and I go, we expect to deal with, you know, 15,000 low impact cyber incidents this year. We expect to deal with, you know, 7,800 medium impacts and, 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 and define what a low impact, medium impact and high impact incidence is and what it means to the business. You know, low impact is something that doesn't affect operations, may affect something small for a few minutes, but we get right back up, we're up and running again. Life is good, right? And we'll deal with a bunch of those over a period. You can deal with 10 of those a day. You can deal it with, you know, one a day sometimes. It just, you know, depends and, and, and so forth. I started executing that in my presentations, and I remember the first time uh, the CIO wanted to audit my board presentation, and he goes, what, what are these numbers? And I go, well, Gartner numbers of, of you know, and Verizon DBIR numbers of low impact, medium impact, and high impact cyber incidents per our industry per average. And he goes, what does the board need to see that? I go, because they need to understand the risk we're dealing with. Why do you need 120 people on your team? Why do you need contractors? Why do you need tools? If if they don't understand, if if think of every low impact costing the business twenty five thousand dollars. Well, if you're dealing with fifteen of those, do the math. Yeah, I, I actually started doing that with my first first few board meetings. Was actually going in and showing real world examples of it uh, in a lot of the different areas, such as obviously like the number of attacks that are there, the cost to business. Uh, and and I had some of the same questions that were asked for me, and I was like, they need to understand that there is a cost on a, uh, for us to do this work, but if we don't do it, here's the other side of the cost with what's happening in the industries out there. So it was very important to not just show, here's my numbers, but here's what we're seeing outside of, and so that you understand when we come and ask requests to beef up certain security um, technologies, or this needs to go in as part of this implementation, why we're doing it. And so it's very, very, very important not just to show your world, but the whole world around you and what um, the, the averages are, the Gartners, the IONS, the different groups can help with that as far as putting that data together for you to help. 
Yeah, that's critical. I mean, I I, t- I love the Verizon DBIR report. I feel like of yes. any report out there, um, you know, I say Gartner and, and I say Gartner and I also put an asterisk because typically if you pay to play, you're in there. And if you don't, you're not. And so, um, you know, am I saying the quiet part out loud? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but it's the quiet part out loud, but it's the truth. Um, but, but within the Verizon DBIR, they're giving you really raw stats and they're breaking down the raw stats. And I find it to be more trustworthy because it's more data points. And so my personal preference, my friends at Gartner don't get offended, but it is, it, it is just, it's, it's, it's that fact that I rely on DBIR far more than, than I rely. And I did a tech corner last week with uh, Javad Malik from uh, No Before. And we talked specifically around cyber research. That's all we spoke about. So the data science behind cyber research, white papers, statistics, webinars, et cetera, and, you know, kind of calling for a standard. Because there isn't one. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. When you go look at statistics that are, even if you're if you're trying to go out, even for some of the what you call reputable, sometimes those numbers um, are misleading or only contain part of the piece. And it is really critical to have some level of standard across so that you're able to report uh, refined numbers versus opinions in some cases, quite honestly, or segmented numbers that don't provide the full full answer. I often, uh, because I'm a CISO and I have a podcast, I deal with two different types of emails, folks. And I'm going to share those with with all of our listeners now. Um, the first one is the traditional CISO email from a vendor trying to sell you something. And the second one is from a PR company trying to push me to interview some vendor on my podcast because of a problem they happen to solve because of a statistic they take out of a report. And so when I did the podcast with Javad, it was we were, Javad and I were on a call and we were just, you know, chatting up and I told him, I go, I have a problem. And my problem is I cannot for the life of me understand where people pull statistics from and then generate entire white papers out of one stat line that supports you buying their product. Now I get marketing and I get the need to make sales and survive and to build your product. I get that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intentionally ignoring other data and picking one data set that supports what you want to say and using that one data set while ignoring all other data sets. You don't have to solve every problem on the world, but I guarantee you that if you present the right data sets, we as I'll I'll speak as a CISO myself. I'm probably going to likely engage you more because when I have the full picture of the full data sets and not just one, I'm more likely to understand that this problem might be a five out of 10 for a normal organization, but it's a nine out of 10 for me. That's right. So I'll engage with you because of that. What I'm not going to engage with is the tactics of putting out one data set and then using that data set to make a white paper, a webinar, or any, any other aspect of it and then go down that, that road. That road, not only does it terrify me, um, I feel that road is extremely misleading. And, and it's it's part of the challenge today of why, you know, when people say, James, I've sent you, you know, seven emails, how come you don't answer me? And I go, well, you're sending me one stat line of a, in a report that I haven't read, I don't know what it is. And I, I, don't, I don't think this is a problem for me, but present me a full, solu- like, just write me three sentences that say, here's what we do. Here's how we do it. Here's why you should consider us. Right. Not very hard. It, it, it's not, but a lot of people don't, don't get it. They do a partial and then they, they narrow on the shiny thing and saying, this is the only way, this is the only piece of information that matters. And it's like, you need to understand your, your, the people that you're trying to, to work with and to support. And unfortunately they get, very narrow and not really focusing on what we can do to help you out. So I want to share something. I got a LinkedIn message on um, September 10th. So a few weeks ago. And um, I never put the names of the companies I'm a CISO for. I don't put them on my LinkedIn page. I also don't put my military service on my LinkedIn page. I feel like, you know what, do a little bit of homework. You'll figure that piece out, but I'm not going to advertise it. I'm going to read this and I'm going to tell you this is everything that's wrong. Hey, James, I've been looking at the Confidential website. 
because mm. my company's name is Confidential. And he looked at Confidential's website. And I'm keen to know how you currently leverage the traffic that comes to your site and that <laughs> generates leads. In brief, we do lead forensics and blah, 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 blah. How does your diary look for a quick online demo this week? <laughs> I answered with one sentence. You saw Confidential's website and reached those conclusions all by yourself. Amazing. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye. And so there are a lot of very good salespeople out there. A ton of very, very good ones highly qualified people that are amazing, that do a great, great job. They get it. But if you're a CEO of a vendor and you're listening to this podcast, train your people to approach. Don't go for the big marketing hypes. You know, I realize your marketing people need to spend money and perform, but if you spend money on building relationships rather than, you know, anything else, you'll probably see better results over a longer period of time than you do in the short burst. And I get it. There's investors and there's pressures and James, you don't understand it. I've built and sold two companies. I know what that's like. I also know that relationship building is far more critical than, um, than anything else. Time for our CISO insight round folks. Scott's going on the hot seat. Oh, and boy. so here we go, guys. Um, hot seat time. Scott, this is going to be a lot of fun. One buzzword for my buzzword graveyard you'd want to get rid of forever. And you've already actually used it, which is cloud. Folks, we're having a slight technical difficulty here. Just a moment. We'll, we're going to get this line right back up and running. So when we put someone on the hot seat, apparently their interconnect, internet connection kind of stalls out um, because of the amount of bandwidth we send over there. <laughs> Scott, are you back with us? I am back with you. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. So I got to tell you, once I put you on the hot seat, your internet connection was like, whoa, this is too hot to handle. I got to, I got to, I got to <laughs> freak out for a second. Um so uh, I couldn't hear, and, and, and I'm sure our audience uh, couldn't as well. What's the one buzzword you'd get rid of? Uh, cloud would be it because there's too much ambiguity. Uh, a lot of companies will share that their product is cloud aware or cloud native. All it is is they bolted something onto their existing product and, and named it cloud. Uh, or they're a third party uh, service provider that have just rebranded themselves as a cloud company. There are some great technologies like you know Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, that are fabulous platforms and, and can provide, I think, a lot of value for, uh, for us. But I think there's just too much ambiguity in using cloud as a generic service term. Cloud, you have been buried six feet deep and the date on your tombstone is September 24th, 2020. Don't worry, Ooh. Cloud, you haven't missed a damn thing. This has been <laughs> one hell of a year. Um, one technology that'll change the way we do cyber. I think artificial intelligence is really going to help. Um, there's, there is so much happening in the world today that we need that type of, um, capability to be able to respond, um, you know, mitigate and resolve items quickly. And I'm not talking the simple, turn this off, turn this on is actually being able to do very robust, um, actions and being able to get to the people that need to look at the manual items much much quicker um because there's just so much noise right now that people are having to dig through so it is really exciting looking at what artificial intelligence is doing uh, in security and in a lot of other industries yeah artificial intelligence is definitely something to look at i will say for folks that haven't seen the uh social media uh documentary on netflix um th it's probably the last thing i'll watch I'm, I'm i'm canceling my netflix subscription at the end of the month um but Definitely something to take a look at. Um, the way social media companies use AI is just fascinating. Um, just fascinating. Um, last book you read, Scott? 
So one of the habits that I have is I will read from a, a leadership productivity book before I start my work day. And then I read from what I'll call a fun book, like a fiction or nonfiction before I go to bed. Um, right now I'm reading Deep Work by Cal Newport, which is helping me really to understand the cost of context switching, you know, going back and forth between the admin type stuff and deep thinking. And so it's really, really helping me to block my time for that key work that makes a difference. Uh, the fun book that I'm reading is actually a biography of Alexander Hamilton. I know there's a lot out there about Hamilton the play. Uh, it's a really, really good book and really uh, amazing to see his very humble beginnings and how he was able to move very quickly through a lot of his uh, traits up into being one of our founding fathers. That's why this country is the greatest country on the planet. Because if you <laughs> read about our founding fathers, they weren't anything special. They were just a bunch of guys that said, we're done. That's right. We're done. Um, and really built a, built an amazing um, check and balances thing. I, I, I'm reading the Federalist Papers now. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it. Uh, I, there's a few books I read once a year. So like every year I read, you know, the art of war, um, yes. and, and I'll read, um, um, think and grow rich. I think these are books that are, that are, that are, that are, you know, kind of like the basis of, of reading. And I obviously read the Torah and the Talmud and, and a bunch of Jewish readings. That's, that's, you know, those who can't see, but behind me. They can't see the other side of the sofa is all of my Jewish text and and everything like that. But yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I, but I can't read more than one. So I'll listen to audiobooks. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Um, I'm, I've, I've, I've actually taken up a few of the um, the great audiobooks that, that I'm into right now um, that are just, you know, magnificent um, to listen to them because they're just you know, listening to an audiobook while you work is also a, a great way to do this stuff, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I had listened to a tremendous number of podcasts. Like, in the same way, I have some fun podcasts um, with some sports and some uh, like movies and so forth. And then I also have some that are very serious about the technical and leadership. And uh, it's a great way to being able to, to continue to grow while you're even doing your work. Absolutely. Um, last movie you saw. So uh, movie theaters are just now starting to show up, and it was an interesting story. We had an AMC theater that was very close to us that had a 15-cent movie night. So for 15 cents, you could have a ticket to go see a movie. Uh, it was the older movie, so it wasn't something brand new. So my wife and I went and saw the first Back to the Future, and uh, that was really, really cool to be able to see that and only pay 15 cents a ticket. Uh, before that, it's it's been a while. I actually enjoyed... Uh, the uh, and this was actually not a movie theater, but actually it was a new movie release was Greyhound, uh, which was came through the uh, Apple ecosystem. Uh, I'm a huge World War II buff, and I really really enjoyed uh, Tom Hanks' uh, position of that uh, that character and just the stress that they went through. I thought it was a really excellent movie. So excellent! I saw Michael J. Fox play the guitar at a Coldplay concert a few years ago uh, wow. in New York. Took my I, I took. Um, uh, she wasn't my wife at the time, but but um, I, I took my my girlfriend to New York to go see Coldplay because that's one of her favorite bands, um, and at the Meadowlands, and they brought out Michael J. Fox and he played two sets with them. It's the only video I took of that entire concert. Was Michael wow. J. Fox on stage ripping a guitar? Love that guy. That, that is great. so awesome. Favorite music. So I, I'm a potpourri. I like lots of different genres. Uh, I, I like a lot of country, I will say. It's probably the newer country, but also like 80s music, 70s, 80s, 90s, like a lot of the, the that, that music. Uh, I like some hair bands um, back from then. And, uh, but I also like some, what I'll call slower, like more of a jazz, blues, just something in the background. Typically, and my kids can, can do that, can tell you this, when I'm driving, I like more upbeat. When I'm at home, just kind of chilling, I just like I like more reflective music. So it also depends on where I am as to what kind of music I'm listening to as well. So Luke Bryan or uh, Florida Georgia Line? 
Uh, I would probably, oh, that's a tough one. I, I would probably say Luke Bryan. I uh, actually partially because Luke went to, I, I grew up actually was from South Georgia. And so Luke Bryan went to Georgia Southern, which is like a stone throw from where I grew up. So I probably would say Luke for that reason more so than Luke. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing you took away from the COVID-19 crisis. I, I think there is, there is so much noise and, and unfortunately is is politicized. Uh, that is out there. I mean, it is just crazy some of the statistics and the information that is out there. And so it's really important to find um, new sources that you can trust that give you the the actual um, piece. One of the, the items that was great for the company I work with is we actually have a doctor on retainer and he's not political at all and he just lays it out straight. And I think that's really the big piece is being able to, to get it straight and communicate, um, but also understand that People are in different situations. You have people that are high risk because of this virus and you need to, to, to take note of those and make sure that they are protected. And then there's also people that are not and they feel like they're Superman and can go do everything. So it's, it's understanding that balance as well. So getting the right data and being able to be a tolerant, whether you're, you don't have any risk factors or if you have every risk factor you need to stay in. So I think that's really the big keys for me for learning from COVID. I will say the following about COVID-19 to wrap up our podcast today. CDC has an Excel that you can download that has all the numbers on it with all the data. And if you're a nerd like I am, just download it, break it down. And honestly, you'll see who it truly impacts and why and where and so forth. And I was reading a story right before we came on the podcast uh, that there's an uptick in several states. Um, in COVID cases. Um, and uh, very interesting. I won't say why those states have an uptick, but I'm sure people can just rest assured to understand that if you go to the CDC and see why those states have an uptick, and then you go and you read any headline story, you'll understand why those people are getting more COVID cases. Um, it's, um, it's, it's one of the same. People just need to be responsible, understand who it threatens, and you know, get back to normal life. Um, we can't, you know, you, you don't hit pause and restart in life. There's, there's no such thing. I think if there was such a button, I think all of us would be using it all the darn time. We wouldn't move forward at all. We'd be like, pause, rewind, pause, rewind, pause, rewind. We can't pause and rewind. We just got to, you know, continue to play and play forward and play forward cautiously and responsibly. Um, take care of the people who are at most at risk. You know, my dad is retired and he's diabetic and so he's at risk. So, you know, he doesn't leave the house. And if he does, he's wearing a mask and he's outdoors. He doesn't go to anything indoors unless he's going to a, you know, a store. And then he's going during the senior hours because he's a high risk guy. We just, you know, we don't, we don't do that. Just be responsible. That's, that's re- personal responsibility. Folks, personal responsibility is critical. We talked about talent. One of the things I look for in talent is personal responsibility. Can you take personal responsibility? That's why, that's how we get over stuff um, in this country. That's how we've always done it in this country. It's personal responsibility. The vision of Alexander Hamilton, there Thomas you go. Jefferson, George <laughs> Washington, personal responsibility. It's unbelievable. Country that's been around for 200 and some odd years because of personal responsibility, folks. Checks and balances. All right. Scott, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. So much insight. Um, on today's episode, folks, I hope you really did enjoy um, today's episode. Make sure you subscribe, tune in. We're going to have so much more next week. Another CISO talk here as we head into October Cybersecurity Awareness Month and November. November is a very special month. It's um, I, I'm I'm making November. I know there's Movember and everyone grows a mustache, and um, you know some people just should know to never grow a mustache, but some people do that anyways. You know who you are. <laughs> um, but um, no, the entire month of November is dedicated to veterans um, and veterans in cyber. So if you're a veteran in cyber and you want to be on the podcast, we're doing a bunch of great content. You can uh, just contact us by the link below or go to our website at cyberhubpodcast.com. That's it for us here today, folks. My name is James Caesar. Scott Sykes, thanks so much for coming on the show. Humbled you. by your knowledge share. Um, folks, you can reach out to Scott. His LinkedIn profile is uh, below here on the video. So you can reach out and connect with Scott. That's it for us here again today, this week. 
We'll be back with so much more next week. Until then, folks, stay cyber safe.